chips and rustling of sandwich wrappers, um, not loud enough, let me know. I want to start today with a poll. Uh, I didn't put this picture up here just because it's pretty. Uh, it's actually the beginning of a few questions I have for the group. By a show of hands, who thinks we need the stars to navigate? OK, good. I'll put it down. <laughs> You're just being contrarian. All right, one more question. Who believes we need these to watch movies? <laughs> and if you're too young to know what these are, <laughs> you're just going to make me feel real old up here. One last question. Who thinks we need cocaine to treat toothaches? I don't mean who wants to have cocaine to treat toothaches. <laughs> who thinks we need it? That's right, because as cute as this is, we obviously don't. We have many better remedies that are far less addictive than cocaine for treating toothaches. My goal today is to convince you that all of those ideas belong beside one more, which is this notion that the University of North Carolina needs to use live pigs or any other animals to teach emergency medicine residents. That's my goal, and at the end we'll find out whether I've convinced you. The fact is that UNC does not need to use animals to teach residents, but nonetheless, every year, it asks residents to perform invasive procedures on these animals before they're ultimately killed. Before we delve into that, it's worth taking a step back and looking at the greater realm of medical education. There are really two areas for the sake of our discussion today that are worth noting. There is medical school training or undergraduate medical education. This is where you go for the first four years of medical training. Every doctor goes through it. And then afterwards, to become a specialist, you go to your residency, of graduate medical education. This is an oversimplification of the medical training field, but for the, sake of our, for the sake of our discussion today, it's all we need to know. First, let's discuss medical student training or medical school, because we've made huge strides in this area when it comes to replacing the use of animals. 30 years ago, this was the norm in US medical schools. Medical students would walk into a lab and there'd be an anesthetized dog on the table. They'd perform minor surgical procedures or inject the dog with drugs to see how the animal would respond physiologically. At the end of the lab, the animals were all killed. 30 years ago, almost 80% of US medical schools taught students using dog labs or other animal labs. And I'm happy to say that I work for an organization that has worked to end this. The Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine has been around since 1985 today. We have 12,000 physician members and 150,000 members total. Many of them are other healthcare providers or scientists. Some of them are actually in this room. And one of our founding goals was the replacement of animals in medical student training. And the reason we had that goal was twofold. It's because we thought it was edu educationally flawed, but also ethically questionable. And we started working with students and faculty to develop new curricula in the 80s and 90s to replace animals. And sometimes we'd get responses like this. This was a letter from the dean of the University of California, Irvine. We wrote to him to tell him, hey, did you know that there is an animal lab, a dog lab specifically, in your medical student curriculum? And here are the reasons we think you should replace it. He wrote back to say, quote unquote, that he has summarily informed the faculty to end the animal lab. Now, this was the easy road. Some schools did this, some schools worked with us. Other schools were a little more entrenched. So sometimes we take out ads like this. This is a much younger Bill Maher from the 1990s who did some work with us. Uh, this was published in medical student uh, uh, publications and student newspapers. Sometimes we put up billboards like this one. A lot of schools, because of the public concern, would switch from dogs to pigs. But the educational and ethical concerns were very much still there, no matter what the species, so we kept working at it. And over the last three decades, I'm happy to say, we've seen a precipitous decline in the use of animals in medical student training, down to 1% as of the start of this year. And I'm happy to say that we made even more progress. But let's go back to May of 2016. There were still two holdouts, Johns Hopkins University and the University of Tennessee's campus in Chattanooga. The only two places as of May 2016 that were using live animals to teach medical students in the United States. In May, Johns Hopkins announced that it was ending its pig lab in which pigs were used for surgical skills training. We went to the president of the University of Tennessee who immediately went to his dean of the School of Medicine and they decided they didn't want to be the last one doing this so a few weeks after Johns Hopkins, 
they stopped too. Now, for the first time in 30 years, there's not a single US medical school using live animals to teach medical students. When I go to medical student conferences and talk about this, they are stunned that any schools actually used to do this when you talk to them about the dog labs that used to happen. Because of that historical reference to see how far we've come, it's worth considering where we were just 20 years ago on this. This is a memo from the University of Nevada School of Medicine. I guess it's probably Nevada, but being out east, I forgot to pronounce it Nevada. But this is the University of Nevada School of Medicine. They were so dedicated to the dog lab that they had in their medical student curriculum that they issued this memo in which they said that it was inconceivable that you could teach medical students without living mammal models. But in 1995, the same year that the University of Nevada faculty and administrators were having a hard time conceiving of a curriculum without animals, Harvard Medical School was replacing its dog lab with a computer simulation lab that we actually worked with them to develop. We actually worked with Harvard so closely that they, even, they made a whole video about their new curriculum. It just goes to show you that while some schools, like Harvard, are stepping into the future in terms of advancing their curricula, other schools, like the University of Nevada, are firmly rooted in the past. And that's what brings us to the discussion at hand today. Because we discussed medical student training, now let's tackle residencies. If you want to be an emergency doctor in this country, you go to an emergency medicine residency after medical school. And there are a lot of them. And a lot of them don't use live animals to teach medical students. None of these do. None of those. None of these. None of those. None of these. And none of those. 142 US emergency medicine residency programs teach physicians without asking them to cut up or kill live animals. On that list of 142, are Carolina's Medical Center in Charlotte, East Carolina, Wake Forest, and Duke. Every other program in North Carolina is on that list, except for the University of North Carolina. And that's why I'm here today, is to discuss this, and hopefully make some headway on it. But before we delve into the reasons why you shouldn't use animals to teach emergency medicine residents, it's worth considering UNC's position on this. And I say UNC's position, but what I really mean is the faculty of the emergency medicine department at the School of Medicine. This isn't a broad university position. It's not even a medical school position. It is the position of the emergency medicine faculty. And with them, this decision lies. But these are the things they've said. There are certain key critical procedures that are best trained using live tissue when possible. Unfortunately, many of the procedures cannot yet be simulated with non-animal models. And lastly, we believe that our physicians are better prepared to perform life-saving interventions for humans as a result. This really boils down to two things, a lack of availability of alternatives and the belief that this is the best way to train, which I guess go hand in hand. But if this were the case, if both those things were true, I think it'd be hard for the University of South Carolina to say what they said just a few weeks ago, last month, when they replaced the use of pigs for their emergency medicine residency program. This is what they said. Continued advances in simulation technology make it possible for us to make this change at this time. In doing so, we affirm our belief that preparing healthcare providers for the preservation of human life is our greatest responsibility, and we are confident that this change will not adversely affect the quality of our training program. So in that statement, they are acknowledging the advances that have been made in non-animal synthetic training methods, and also that they believe this change will have an, at least a net impact, a net zero impact on how they take care of patients. So what is it that the University of South Carolina and other programs are replacing animals with? I expect that if many of you have not been through medical school or other types of medical training, you're not familiar with these. But let's talk about a few of them. This is Trauma Man, probably the most popular surgical skills simulator in the world used at hundreds of locations in the United States, hundreds of others across the world. Trauma Man can be used for some of the procedures that, are, that animals are used for in the UNC curriculum. It has replaceable skins, so trainees can actually get a first cut feel. That's something you obviously can't do on a pig. Once you cut an animal's tissue, that's the only cut you can make. But on Trauma Man, you can replace the synthetic tissue. But I want to talk about a couple others. And the next photo I'm going to show you is a little gory, but just keep in mind this is all fake. 
This is the emergency thoracotomy trainer. It's made by a company called Operative Experience and was funded by the U.S. Army in development and, and today used by the U.S. Army. It actually allows trainees to have in-chest access. So you can replicate a human torso and perform invasive procedures on the chest cavity, including on the heart. Because there's, there's a synthetic heart inside there. This is very relevant because UNC is teaching open chest procedures using PIPs. But there's one other device I want to tell you about, and that's SimMan. Many of you may have seen him before. He bleeds, he breathes, he blinks. You can hook him up to a computer and he'll provide data feedback. You can inject him with quote unquote drugs and he will respond like human patients would. He's very popular with the military because you can drag him into the field, into these immersive training scenarios in which there are bullets whizzing by and artificial bombs going off. And it's again, one of the most popular across the country. The availability of devices like this is probably why one of the military's medical training experts said this in 2014. Major Andrew Hall said that we have entered into an age where artificial simulator models are at least equivalent to, if not superior to, animal models. He wasn't being coy about that. He published this in a letter in the Journal of Military Medicine. And Dr. Hall didn't come to this decision lightly. If you had looked at his studies from a few years earlier, he was constantly saying the devices aren't there yet, the replacement me methods aren't there yet. But in 2014, which was again two years ago, in 2014 he acknowledged that after much research, and he was conducting comparative studies during this period, this is the opinion he came to. There's one other thing regarding the viability of training that we should discuss, and that is stress. How does it make the trainees feel when they take part in an animal lab or in a simulation lab? Now, this isn't an argument UNC has put forward. I, I gave you their arguments, but it's one that has been put forth by other programs that have used animals in the past and still do currently. So it's worth considering, and I just want to cover our bases. How does it make us feel? Because there's something to be said for training people in a stressful environment, since they're going to have to perform those procedures in a stressful environment later on, especially emergency doctors. Well, there's been a lot of research into this, luckily, and I want to share with you just a couple studies. This is one of them. This is actually a study involving emergency medicine residents. They simulated an emergency scenario using a simulator, and they found that physiological arousal suggests that the residents developed a sense of urgency and responsibility for managing the simulated patient. We were able to demonstrate that residents adequately suspended disbelief and performed as if it were real. Suspended disbelief is the operative phrase, because time and again you see this in the literature, in research studies. As much as you might not believe it, trainees forget that this synthetic patient in front of them, sim man, trauma man, whatever else, is not real, and they perform as, as if it were. And they know what these physiological responses happen because they measured blood pressure and saliva and hormone, uh, stress hormones and other things during the study. There's one more I want to share with you, and this was a medical student study in which they simulated a cardiac arrest. And they found that the present study showed that a simulated emergency situation is a strong stressor with profound endocrine and psychological effects. They measured saliva in the trainees during this study, and what they found were high levels of cortisol, which is a stress hormone. The same kind of thing you'd find if you were in an ER and under duress. So, there's been lots of literature that shows you that synthetic models can train just as well, if not better than animals, when it comes to recreating those stressful environments. The last thing we should discuss is the pigs themselves. Because they're not an inanimate objects, there are ethical concerns regarding the use of animals for research, training, testing. For today, we're just talking about medical training. But these are not inanimate objects. Pigs are highly intelligent animals with great long-term memories. They uh, actually play video games you give them the video game, they can perform these. They've been rated as smarter than dogs and as smart as primates in some studies. They are highly intelligent animals, but most importantly for our discussion today, they, like us and dogs and cats, can suffer. So it's worth considering what the pigs go through before and during the training scenario. Now, UNC shrugs off any concerns about the animal's welfare by saying this. We perform these procedures on animals who are under general anesthesia and hence do not experience pain with the procedures. Let's take them at their word. This is 
very likely the case that the animals are so deeply anesthetized during the procedures that they do not feel the invasive medical procedures performed on them, and at the end of it, they're given an overdose of anesthesia and they're killed. But what about before the lab? Because the pigs are obviously bred somewhere, they're raised, they're shipped, and they're prepared for the lab, all things that can cause a lot of stress during their life. It is not an inconsequential consideration. So where does UNC get its pigs from? Well, they get them from North Carolina State University, and they pay $78 a pop for them. Pretty cheap price for a pig. But NC State has some recent run-ins with violations of the Federal Animal Welfare Act, which is the only law in the country that covers animals in laboratories. This was a 2011 settlement agreement between the US Department of Agriculture, which enforces the Animal Welfare Act, and North Carolina State University. And it fined them $5,000, which is a pretty big fine, actually. A lot of USDA fines get settled down to almost nothing. So $5,000, even though it's a slap on the wrist for a major university, is not inconsequential. And what USDA found was that the faculty failed to provide training that would adequately ensure the animal's well-being. Here you see a situation in which a cat actually died because of that poor education. The cat happens to be one of the many animals at NC State. There are obviously pigs and there are other species. The cat was just a consequence of the bad training program. They found them in violation of, of another piece of the statute as well. And like I said, they fined them $5,000 for this. This is where UNC gets its animals. But as I mentioned, after they're bred there and they're raised there, they're shipped. They're put in a truck and they're brought here, and then they are prepared for the lab. And I, I grew up on a pig farm, and if anyone who's ever been around pigs in a semi-natural environment knows they don't like riding in trucks, and if you confine them to a small, sterile space like a laboratory, preparation for the lab itself can cause a lot of distress. So these are all things that should be taken into account. And considering all of this, why does UNC continue to use animals to teach emergency medicine residents? I don't know, but we've heard their arguments and I think we've addressed them. So after hearing all this, after seeing the documents I've just shown you, we went to the UNC emergency medicine faculty and we proposed alternatives and we got crickets in response. So we went to the media back in July and there was a lot of coverage. Uh, all of these publications and many more picked up this issue. So it's obviously being discussed. It's obviously something that the School of Medicine and the Emergency Medicine faculty are aware of. And what I like to do is to try to stop this, obviously. And if I've convinced you that this is worth stopping, then I'd like your help. There are some things you can do as members of the UNC community. First, I'd like you to either go to your phone right now and go to this website, pcrm.org forward slash UNC, or write it down and go there later. Grab one of the leaflets on your way out. The URL is there. And on that website, you can send an email to the School of Medicine Dean and the Emergency Medicine Chair, and you can ask them to stop this practice. But in addition to this, you can get more involved. If you're on campus, if you care about this, if this is something you want to stop, there are small ways in which you can get more involved. There are two groups, an undergraduate group and a law school group who are working to end this. And I'd encourage you to stick around and talk to them and help us stop this. I have no doubt that UNC is going to stop this. The University of Nevada, the place that found it inconceivable that you could teach medical students without animals, four years later ended its dog lab. I don't think it's gonna take four years with UNC, but it's gonna take some work to get there, and I hope you'll help us. Thank you.